Okay. Welcome back. We are looking today at Genesis 18. And we last time we it was a few weeks back, but we we discussed Genesis 17, the covenant God sets up with Abram, he changed his name to Abraham, and we have this covenant of circumcision. And now we have this, this interlude in Genesis 18 where the Lord appears to him again. Um, and so this time at the Oaks of Mamre, which we've seen before. So let's take a look at our passage and get right into it and see where it takes us. So uh, Bob Thomas, would you read that for us here? Sure. Verses 1 to 8, Genesis 18, 1 to 8. And the Lord appeared to him by the Oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourself and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three sheaves of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set it before them. And he stood by by them under the tree while they ate. Okay. All right. So the first part we have is this. Uh, so the Lord now appears to Abram. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this now. The, the, we call this the appearance of the Lord. And first thing is, is where he appears and then how he appears to him. So wh where does he appear to Abram? Abraham, I should say. He's now Abraham. It's it's outside his tent um, underneath the oaks of, of Mamre. Yeah, so by the oaks of Mamre. Now, we've heard them before, the oaks of Mamre. We've heard of them uh, as he sat at, at, at his tent. Um, this is uh, the first time we saw the oaks of Mamre was in Genesis uh, 13. Let me see if I got it here. Um in Genesis 13, at the end, uh, it's when Abraham and Lot, Abram and Lot separate. If you remember back then, let me pull it back a little bit to Genesis 13. Um, too far, too far, too far. Let's see if we can get it. Eight, nine, ten, oh, 15, uh, 13. So we had the story with Abraham, Abram and Lot have that conflict and they separate and after they separate lot goes to sodom and abram it says in verse 18 moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of mamre which are at hebron so there's the first mention of the oaks of mamre it's at that separation now so that was back gosh that that was that was like 14 years earlier if i recall at least that much um and so, but it's interesting. That's where they part ways. That's when that's when Lot goes to Sodom and settles there, and this is where Abram uh, settles at the Oaks of Mamre. All right, so that's uh, the starting point there. So he's still there after all these years. Um, and again, it could be I don't know. It could be as many as twenty years. I, I'm not sure exactly how long it was, but it was at least like fourteen, fifteen years at this point. Um, so it was Genesis 13 when Lot goes to Sodom. Abraham went to Mamre. Okay. All right. So now when he looks up his eyes, and what does he see when the Lord appears to him? He sees three men. Okay. Three men. Standing. He, he seemed to immediately know that it was the Lord. Yeah, he bows himself to the earth and says he something about him. He's he knows it's the Lord. 
Now, again, the Lord has appeared to him before. Uh, yeah, this isn't the first time the Lord has appeared to him. So there, are, we don't know what the Lord, we never describe what the Lord looks like. But just that he appears, there's some distinguishing marks of him that, that Abraham recognized this is the Lord. But there are three men. So the three men, we could say, look, all right, one, okay, one is the Lord. Who are the other two? Angels. Yeah. The other two we find out are going to be angels. Uh, they're the ones going to be heading up to Sodom later on. But for now, uh, we have the other two or angels. We'll find out later on. All right. So Abraham's reception of them. Um. Abram, Abraham receives the men, and what does he do for them? Washes their feet and feeds them. Okay. Uh, he, he actually doesn't wash their feet. Um, gives them water to wash their feet. Yeah, he gives them water to wash their own feet. Gives them water. This is uh, my, 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 I had an Old Testament professor that kind of highlighted this for us to understand the foot washing. Is servants did not typically wash their master's feet. They would prepare the water and bring it to them so they wash their own feet. Because to wash someone's feet is a very intimate thing to do. Uh, it's not something you would you would just do to somebody. And, and so when Jesus washes the feet of his disciples, it's not it's 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 more, even more than an act of humility. It's it's this act of intimacy that he is willing to to, to do that to handle a very tender, vulnerable part of a person. Uh, that's why I, I foot washings are always so uncomfortable for me. Uh, it's because not because it's something beneath uh, me. It's just very intimate and it's, it's in the, in the, in the wrong setting. It's very awkward and strange, uh, but he gives them water for their feet. And what else does he do? Um, Tell them uh, to rest themselves. Yeah. Has them. And then he was going to bring them food. And brings them food. This is really interesting. What is, the, what is this saying here about the way the Lord appears now? This is kind of shocking. Remember, remember the last time how the Lord appeared to Abram in the last chapter, how he described himself? Remember, uh, if we go back to 17... When God appeared to Abram in 17, how did he do it? I am God Almighty. Al Shaddai. Yeah, I am God Almighty. So in 17, he comes to him as God Almighty. This is not a picture of God Almighty, is it? I mean, he's Abraham is coming and ministering to him, telling God Almighty to rest and gives him food and water. Um, so there is this, uh, this remarkable... Um, what a way that that God that the Lord that the Lord God Almighty appears, and it's not like just a short rest. He's got to be there at least for a couple hours. Yeah, because yeah. you know it's it's bake the bread and it's you know yeah slaughter and then prepare the meat. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and he has Sarah prepare the cakes and brings them over there. The curds and milk and the calf that he prepared, um, set them before them, and he stood by them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. So the Lord, uh, the three men eat as Abraham stands by as a servant, as 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 their host. Um and so the Lord Almighty appears in 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 weakness in a human form. So this even even the Old Testament we we see this is a clear situation where God, there's no question the Lord is there, appeared to him, and the Lord appears to him in the human form that is fully human. I mean, not just an appearance of a man, but as a man, and in, in one who needs to eat and to to rest. Um, it's really, it's an incredible scene. Um, so that's the first appearance here. Let's look at our next section here. Um, Claudette, you want to get the next paragraph nine to 15? Okay. 
Can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. Claudette, you're on mute. You're on mute, Claudette. Try it again. Try it again. <laughs> mute, I'm mute. There you, uh, go. there you go. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So she laughed. To, she, so Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. Okay. All right. All right. So now the question is regarding Sarah. So they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? Uh, they, the three men, uh, the three, um, ask about Sarah. Um, she's in the tent. And so now the Lord uh, makes a promise, uh, the Lord's uh, promise. And what does he say here? Regarding Sarah. She's going to have a baby next year. Yeah. Um, at this time next year, Sarah will have a son. Um, Sarah's response, <clears throat> she hears the word <clears throat> and hearing the promise. What's her, what's her response to this? You've got to be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is. Uh, she laughs. As Abraham did. Yeah, but notice how she laughs. Well, no, no, very carefully what it says. She laughs what? To herself. To herself. Okay. So she's not. So at the end, he kind of calls her out on this, but it's she's not kind of lying. She's, she didn't laugh out loud necessarily. But to herself, in her own heart, she's kind of laughing at the thought. That um, after I am old and worn out, shall I have this pleasure? After I'm worn out, and and Abra and my Lord Abraham is old, really. So, and it's it is kind of laughable when you think about it. I mean, she's she is at this point, I believe she's about ninety years old, eighty nine when she gets this word, and Abraham is ninety nine like yeah it is it is awfully strange it's awfully strange um the lord responds to sarah well actually she speaks to abraham and what is what happens there that's when why sarah laughed yeah why why does why does she laugh. Why did and, and laugh about bearing a child? And and why why is it in, in the Lord's perspective to Abraham? It's like, um, how does he say why why is this uh, not really appropriate for her to laugh? Well, it's kind of like he said uh, she's saying, God can't make this happen. I'm too old. Yeah, you know it, it is ridiculous. Except that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Um, when nothing is too hard for the Lord. So she's, she's not, she, she's laughing at the impossibility of this. This is not possible. Uh, it's it's that laugh is sort of an, it's, an, it's a laugh of unbelief. I, I don't believe that this is possible. And reminds him, is there anything too hard for the Lord? So remember when the Lord appears to Abraham in, Genesis 17, he introduced himself as I am God Almighty, which means that nothing's impossible for me. Uh, there is nothing too hard for the Lord. If he is God Almighty, there is indeed nothing too hard for the Lord. And he reinstates the thesis and he reinstates, um, he reaffirms the promise. 
um, Sarah, uh, so, so Sarah, her response to the Lord. I didn't do that. Yes, yeah, Sarah, Sarah denies laughing. And you could make a case uh, that she's she's not lying necessarily because again it wasn't it was she laughed to herself and so if you're kind of in your own mind laughing about an idea and someone says why are you laughing you're like i'm not laughing you know and in one sense she verbally was not denies laughing uh, she did not verbalize her and he basically says that because he says no but you did laugh yes yes uh, but the Lord, remember, sees the heart. And uh, yes, uh, no, no, you did, you did laugh. He sees the unbelief; it's in the heart. So, so, and and you don't. I can't blame Sarah in many ways. Like it's completely reasonable for her to to be in such disbelief. That's why faith is a, a remarkable thing. When someone has faith to believe impossible promises. Uh, Sarah has a hard time with that, um, but uh, she comes around. So, all right. So that's the, we'll pick that story up next time of what happens a year later. But in the meantime, um, we have this interlude regarding Sodom. And so let's pick it up there. And I'm going to just do something here. I'm going to insert a page break so I can get it on one page. That's a little better. So let's pick it up. Uh, Rob, uh, Rob Roy, would you get 16 to 21? Okay. Then the men set out from there and they looked down <laughs> towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. All right, so the men set out from there, and they now the eyes uh, they they look uh, towards Sodom. Uh, and as Abraham is about to set them on their way, and the Lord says something now. Uh, he has a little little bit of a speech here uh, regarding uh, Abraham, and what does he say? Um, in verse seventeen. Uh, the Lord speaks. What's he? What does he say here? Should I let Abraham know what I'm going to do? Yeah. Shall I hide from Abraham? You know the significance of this that that the Lord is what I am about to do. Uh, that the Lord is. What does this have to do with Abraham? You say. Well, I mean. Well, you know, he's his family's in there. He has family in there, um, but when the Lord has His plans and He's 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 ready to share that with Abraham, do you know what that the significance of that is? There's actually a parallel in the Gospels. Um, do you remember when Jesus says to His disciples? I think it's in John. He says, um, "I no longer call you servants; I call you friends." Do you remember that part and what what He says about what what is it that friends have that servants don't have? Knowledge of what he's doing. Yeah, he says the servants don't know what their master's business is, but a friend does. Um, so he's 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 really speaks to Abram as a Abraham as a friend. He's willing to share his plans with him and what he is about to do. Um. And he sees that uh, he's about to become surely become a great and mighty nation. It, you know, it kind of reaffirms the covenant promise one more time uh, with Abraham. Uh, he says he's going to be a great and mighty nation, and all the nations 
shall be blessed in him. And then he says, uh, verse 19, let's look at that one more time here. Well, when he's saying all of this, he's, it's more like he's thinking it. He's not, he's not actually saying these covenant, uh, reaffirm it, reaffirming the covenant with Abraham. He's just restating it to himself, right? Well, it's well. The, the setting is the the Lord and the two other men. So the the three yeah. of them are are going toward S Sodom, and Abraham is walking out with them. Yeah. And so I think the assumption is the Lord is speaking to the other two, and saying, "Shall I hard for, hide from Abraham what I am about to do?" Because he's sending those two on that mission now to a to Sodom. Yeah. Um. And so he's speaking to them. It seems about what uh, shall I hide from Abraham, what I'm about to do. Uh, and he speaks to them, these heavenly witnesses. He reaffirms the covenant promises in Abraham's sight to these heavenly witnesses. I'm about to, he's going to become a great mighty nation and all nations will be blessed in him. Uh, and I've chosen him. <clears throat> what does he say he's chosen him for? That's kind of it. This is a new, a little bit of a new, new it's, word. It's based to basically to be the father of his people. Yeah. Um, so he's going, I've chosen him that he may command his children and household uh, to keep the way of the Lord. Uh, the, the children and household that he doesn't really doesn't have just yet of the Lord. Uh, doing righteousness and justice. Um, uh, so the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Huh. So he makes this, it's really interesting. He's, he makes this unconditional promise to Abraham, but the, the, the way that he presents it is that it is an unconditional promise no strings attacked, no requirements. And yet, through that promise, Abraham has been chosen to command his household to keep the way of the Lord. Uh, and that as he is a man of faith, the Lord will work out, give to Abraham all that he's promised. It's really a, an interesting way it's kind of laid out. It doesn't present it as, you know, Abraham is going to, Abraham, if you do justice and righteousness, then I will do all these things for you. It's rather, I'm doing these things for you. These are these things. And the fact is you will do righteousness and justice. Um, you're by, you say salvation is by grace, um, but it's received through faith. And Abraham is indeed a man of faith. All right. So then he says, uh, um, the Lord's plans. Uh, so let's take a look at his plans. What does he say? Verse. Let's read that again. Um, verse 20 and 21. Um, Bob Fowler, you want to get that for us? Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Okay. So the Lord's plan, uh, he says, first off, is what? The, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah <laughs> is great, and their sin is grave. Because the question is, outcry, who is... Who's out crying against, who do you suppose are those crying out against Sodom and Gomorrah? Any, any thoughts on that? Maybe the uh, the other two who they want to have their way with them. I don't know if we've gotten to that point yet. We haven't gotten to that point yet. That wouldn't be them. Um, no. Someone's crying out against Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, those two are going to check it out. Uh, but someone is crying out against Sodom and Gomorrah. The question is, who is that crying out? I mean, out? it would have to be like travelers, I would think, because he, the, he's basically going to be wiping out all of Sodom and Gomorrah. So, you know, it has to have been people that, you know, passed through there. And, 
you know, normally you would have been, you know, treated respectfully and given food and water and what have you as you were passing through. That would be normal. But instead, they're just having their way with anybody that pass, comes in their path. Yeah, you would say the, the basic, the classification of those who cry out um, are going to be the, the vulnerable. Uh, that could be the the widows, uh, the orphans, the travelers, um, the, you know, the strangers, anybody who is vulnerable in this place, who has no defender. And God even says that. He says, you know, make sure, he says, you take care of the poor and the widow and the uh, because they will cry out to me and I will hear them and avenge. And so that's how it works. He says, you have these vulnerable people, the children, the lost, the the, those who are weak and at the mercy of the society. And if if they are not taken care of, if, if you don't hear their cries, they will cry out to me and I will hear and I will repay. Um, the Lord des described himself as the father of the fatherless. Um, he hears their cry. And so that's the this, this crying out against Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're told it's Sodom and Gomorrah is not just on trial for their sexual perversity. They were sexually perverse but they were also in other passages and in, in they're described as those who oppressed the poor and the helpless they were that's the, they go hand in hand this this decadent um luxurious self-centered selfish wicked lifestyle goes hand in hand with the oppression of the weakest and the vulnerable so the thing that i, I don't know is my head gets into trying to just uh, put this in perspective because the poor and the the widows and the orphans that are there, they're all going to die with them. Now, they don't necessarily go to hell, but I, yeah. mean, I think we're about to hear that if I can find 10 people that are good, you know. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of you know it's sort of like this is what often happens in in wicked societies like they they become so corrupt um, even though there are innocent people within them you know the whole like look Nazi Germany is just devastated absolutely destroyed at the end of the war um, and there were I'm sure many innocent Germans in there too um, but it's just the yeah. The the sins of the country are so great, but it's also in some some of these cases, you'll see where those who are being oppressed are praying for uh, someone to come and just wipe them out uh, because it's so awful. I mean, there was a I don't know if you saw this. Um, there was a story about a father in in Israel whose daughter he found out his daughter was killed in the attacks. Eight year old daughter was killed. So he, he was thankful that she wasn't kidnapped and taken to Gaza. You know, because he knew the kind of horrors that she would have to endure. And it was a mercy that she was wiped out like that. Um, you know, a girl. Yeah. Just, Incredible. I mean, and I think you're getting a taste of the, the depravity that men are capable of when you're looking at these Palestinians coming, the terrorists coming in from Palestine uh, and what they did. I mean, you just, it's shocking uh, the depravity that, and and just imagine uh, a whole, the land of Cain and all like that, uh, of that sort of mentality and Sodom and Gomorrah like this. Yeah. But it's even even worse. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah is a luxurious place. It's like Epstein's Island. It's like the sex trafficking places where the rich and the wealthy go and they, and they, they snatch these children off the street to serve them as their slaves. I mean, that's the kind of perversity and wickedness that's there. It's not even it's even worse than if Sodom and Gomorrah were desperately poor and they are just they're doing this evil just to survive. You know, they they are not. They are they are living in the lap of luxury and they are so hardened and depraved that any chance they can to satisfy their depraved appetites, they take even at the expense of whoever it is. Um, it's 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 so wretched. So the all cry is great against Sodom and Gomorrah for their sin. Um, but you'll notice he doesn't he doesn't just destroy them. Um, let's take a let's consider this. He says, I will go down 
to see whether they have done according to that. I think it, I think it's important not to hop over that language. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think if, uh, uh, whenever we <laughs> interpret a passage, if one of God's fundamental attributes gets flushed, we're, we're interpreting that passage wrong. Yes, correct. And um, so what's going on here with this? Why? I mean, the Lord, Lord sees everything, right? Is this, does this mean that there are things the Lord doesn't know? Um, that he has to actually go down physically and look at these things to to uh, to know what's the what's going on here. This this book is God's revelation. So a young Jew who wants to know what this God is like that he claims to believe in would look at this kind of language, this anthropomorphic language, and would gain knowledge about what God is. God is revealing to him that God sees that he can't be snowed. Um, uh, you know, I hear the cry of the poor. He's he is aware of everything. Um, yeah. and, and and I mean, they could have used the word omniscient. Yeah. And and a Jewish person, a young man, would say, "What the heck is that?" He doesn't understand that word omniscient, but he understands God seeing. Yeah. He understands what that says about God. You know. Yeah. God. God. So God hears, and God sees in this, and it, and I think you know it's important to understand. It's like the. The, the trial, God indeed sees the hearts of men. This is an important scene for us, um, for us to understand that what's coming upon Sodom is the wrath of God. This is judgment day for Sodom. And if he just rains fire from heaven, seeing the hearts of men, blows up Vesuvius and destroys the place, right? If he does that... Uh, there is no lesson learned in this. It's just a tragedy. It's just, oh, what a shameful thing. That's uh, it's an accident. Um, but he goes down and he puts them on trial so that we will see the wickedness of them and draw the connection that what's about to happen to Sodom is the wrath of God. They have been tried, and he, he is, he's giving them a fair trial. He's sending two witnesses down there to testify, to confirm that these reports, these cries out are true, that you're you're seeing that. And that's one of the things about the story of what happens with the witnesses is you see their wickedness on full display. They are the ones on trial and it's exposed. So when, when the, it rains fire and sulfur upon them, it is clear that uh, they deserve this. This is the wrath of God on display for them. Whereas if he just says, look, I know everything, they're sinners and wicked, I'm going to destroy them. Um, we might look at that and say, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. They're not so bad. You know, what they do deserve this. Um, and here he puts them on trial and exposes their sin before destroying them. Um, it's a very important process of God's judgment. You, 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 you do not just destroy people in judgment. They must be exposed and they must sort of have a, a, a fair shake, so to speak. Uh, so for the sake of uh, not for the Lord's sake, but for the sake of of His people, of the world, of the of even the angels watching these things, uh, all things are done uh, justly. So He says He goes through the process. I'm going to go down, going to see firsthand, ground level view, and and reveal what is going on here. So, yeah, this is not a denial of the omniscience of God. It's it's more of a focus on His process of how He judges and revealing things. So. Let's uh let's pick it up from here. Um, twenty two to twenty six. Um, where we leave off here. Uh, Bob Thomas, you want to get that for us? Yeah, you know, just one more thing. I've actually heard Christians imply that God had to go look. <laughs> yeah, that's painful. <laughs> it's you know, more that he's educating us the way you know a good father, rather than just punishing his kid, he wants to make sure that he understands why. Yes. Yes, it's really important. Yeah. That's, a, that's a great word. Like I, you know that. Like I know that. Like I know, you know, you, you know, when your son's in a rebellious place, you, you as a dad, you know it, and you, you know that he is. He's in a bad place, but you can't punish him for for things that are sort of hidden. It needs to be exposed first, mm -hmm. and then you can deal with the punishments. Yeah. So it's really an exposure of of it, uh, bringing it to the light here. So the. The fruit, the Lord knows that that tree is bad, but he can't cut it down 
until the fruit is revealed and he can show it to you. See, it's a bad tree. It needs to go. So, you know, he says, and and uh, and if not, I will know. It says yeah. at the end of that sentence. And so you get those open theists running around oh. that yeah. think that that God is actually taking in new information and learning things. That's problematic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it is. It's very problematic. They take they take a story that is describing things in certain ways, um, and they it's not, and they ignore the text that clearly show. Look, nothing is hidden from his sight. The Lord sees, he knows all things. There's no, so. All right, verse 22 to 26. So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that for you, uh, from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom, 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Okay. Abraham now, um, notice this, his, his, he stood before the Lord. And here we can see him now sort of acting as the priest, uh, the intercessor. And what does he do? Notice how he pleads. Um, he draws near to the Lord. Um, and what does he say? Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Um the question, so he's appealing now um, to the righteousness of God, which requires that, um, yes, the wicked should be punished, but the righteous should not be punished with the wicked. So this is the idea of like, you know, far be it from the Lord to punish the righteous. Uh, so there needs to be... Uh, uh, to punish the righteous. And this is not, and he's not talking about the perfect. We're told in Second Peter that first or second Peter, um, that Lot was righteous. If you remember that, uh, Peter refers to him as righteous Lot. So when we talk about righteous, what's the difference between the righteous and the wicked? We're, again, we're not talking about the perfect. We're all sinners. But the difference between the righteous and the wicked is, how would you describe it? The righteous are at least trying. They get it wrong, but they're trying. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I would put it that way. It's like, it's 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 about um, the direction you're going. It's sort of the, the, the righteous um, are trying, of, uh, are, are trying, and they are uh, seeking God. Um, failing, sure, um, but seeking him. We, I, I would be so bold to say that we are considered the righteous here. Uh, as we're striving, we're not perfect. We're going to sin. We're going to fail. Um, but we're, we're striving. We're seeking the Lord. We, we want to do right. We, we are uh, grieved by our own sin. Um, the wicked, in a sense, um, the wicked don't care about these things um they're self-seeking uh there is no remorse there is no guilt um it's just do as we please and so there's this disposition between the righteous and the wicked we would say the righteous are those of good will uh, versus those who are of ill will i, I see this all the time in, in in marriages where uh, a couple will have 
a problem in their marriage and they are, are come to a crisis point. And you can almost tell very quickly whether this is going to work out or not. If, if they're both of goodwill, you could sit down with them, have one or two conversations, and they're on their way. And they'll struggle, but they'll figure it out if they're both of goodwill. If, if one of them is not of goodwill, of ill will, and, and really doesn't want to be in this anymore, is out, checked out, doesn't want this to work, you can go through years of counseling and it's, it's doomed. It's never going to work if just one of them is of ill will. And, but oftentimes it happens. They, they, they're, one of them wants out of the marriage, but they don't want to be the bad guy, right? So they do the charade of let's go get counseling and we'll try to figure this out. But they really, they just want out. And, but they don't have the courage to say it and be honest. And so you end up with wasted money and counseling sessions uh, and the thing is doomed because in a sense, there's one of goodwill who wants this to work out, one of ill will. And so the wicked are those who they don't care. They're not seeking the Lord. They're seeking their own pleasures. The righteous, like Abraham, is considered right. Sarah would be considered righteous. Lot is righteous. Even though Lot is severely flawed, he is called righteous in this passage. Um, so we have this big difference here. And he says, "I, you know, yes, Sodom deserves to be wiped off the map. Uh, but there's got to be some righteous people there. Um, so not to judge the Lord. Right? So he pleads, he says, for 50 men, um, for 50 righteous Will you spare the city? And the answer from the Lord is? Yes. Yes. Now, what's the what's mo the motivation for Abraham? In, why is he pleading for Sodom? Why does he care about the city and uh, trying to save it? Oh. Because Lot is in there. He knows Lot is in there. Yeah. Yeah. A Abraham, let's keep that in mind. Uh, remember, uh, the goal of Abraham is not to spare Sodom. Uh, to spare Lot. Uh, is Abraham, we, have to, we know that. Abraham is interceding for Lot. That's, he has been his son to him. Uh, he has really been Lot's father for all these years, and so he cares deeply about him. So when he hears the news that this his city he's living in is about to be destroyed, he gets he's emboldened to draw near and intercede, and the intercession goes on. So he gets good news. The Lord will spare the city if he can find 50, just 50 righteous people. I mean, that's there's got to be 50 righteous people there. It can't be that bad, can it? Um, so let's take a look. What happens next here? Um, Claudia, you still with us there? Uh, I I am here. Okay. Uh, do you want to read the next section here, the last part here, 27 to 33? I will. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found. There he answered. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, "I will not do it if I find thirty there." He said, "Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there." He answered, "For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it." Then he said, "Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose ten are found there." He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way. When he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Okay. Okay. Abraham continues to intercede now. I want, I want to take a look carefully at the way he says things. 
So the first thing he says is what? Um, in verse 27, um, notice how he approaches now. He comes boldly, but look what he says in verse 27. I'm dust. Yeah. I am but dust and ashes. I don't have a right to ask, but. But I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Uh, he, really, it's it's this humble boldness. He's like, he dares to speak to the Lord while fully acknowledging I am just dust and ashes. And so he says, can we cut off five? And he says, of course. Okay. So success. He gets some success here. So uh, we would say, um, so from, was that 50 to 45? Now, what's the next thing he says? Um, again, he spoke. Suppose 40. Suppose you find 40. Yep. And he says, so there we have from 45 to 40. Works again. It keeps coming back. Okay. What's the next one? Um, um, oh, 30. 30. Yeah. Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak. And he gets the Lord to drop it down from 40 to what? 30. 30. You can see he's, he's he's picking it up a little bit now. He's like, I got five. I got five. How about 10 more? Will that work? Down to 30. He's still he's still not feeling good about the number. He <laughs> think he knows a little bit more about Sodom, perhaps. And what's the next thing he says? Um, All right. Behold, I have undertaken. Speak the Lord again. Can you knock off another 10? And let's take off 10 more from 30 to 20. All right. <laughs> One more time. Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak again. But Wait, he goes 20 and then he goes 10. Yeah. Uh, but this once. And we go from... 20 now to 10. And every time the answer is the same. For the sake of the 45, I won't destroy it. For the sake of the 40, for the sake of the 30, for the sake of the 20, even the 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord yeah. went as well. You know, sometimes the, there's that, I mean, does God laugh, you know? you got to believe that he knows what's going on here. Oh, and it's like, okay, how far is he going to do this? <laughs> I would have thought he would have gone down to one because given, you know, Lot is there, you know. Yeah, I mean, I may, maybe he's thinking, all right, Lot. We got Lot and his wife. That's two. They got two girls. That's four. Their, their girls have fiancés. That's six. So there's six in his sphere of influence. There's got to be a few more out there. Maybe a next door neighbor or someone. There's got to be someone out there. And of course, we find out that uh, can't even find ten. But uh, what what's what's the point of what's the point of this dialogue? It seems it's almost exhausting to read it. He prays once, six it times. Will, it will you save my family? Uh, yeah, one of the first points of it is <clears throat> Abraham's uh, deep concern for his family. Um, absolutely. What else does this interaction reveal? Well, it, as you said earlier, it, it, we know Abraham's a prophet. It shows him to be a priest and that he's intervening for the people. Yeah. And the, yeah. You know, that office comes into view. But um, yeah, we, you know, keep that in mind. We're children of Abraham. We are children of Abraham. So the privilege of, of Abraham to uh, speak to the Lord. And to be heard um, is great. And that's a privilege that we share as believers. To come to him in prayer. That we can nag the Lord like this. Praying six times like this in one setting. Um, 
we got to keep that in mind. It's like, what a, what a privilege that we have to come to the Lord in prayer like this through Christ. And even, even a greater privilege than Abraham has is that we have a, we have a high priest in Christ himself who's cleared the way. So that privilege of Abraham is ours, that we are, uh, we can follow in his steps. What does this reveal about the Lord? Well, he's you got, said he's... like right at the beginning, he came as, he came as a friend, you know, yeah. the way he came wasn't, as the almighty God, he came as a friend and he spoke, he, he told of his plans as a friend, Yeah, you know? So this is, okay, I'm a friend. Let me, let me take advantage of my, you know, my friendship part of it, you know, the right that you've given me. Yeah. He invites him into this as a friend. Yeah. That's a great picture. You know, you have the two things of the sometimes called the, the transcendence of God, and the imminence of God, the transcendence. He is God Almighty. He knows the thoughts of men. He He is completely controlled. He is holy and above it all, and yet He is He is imminent. He is near to us. Um, he He speaks to us as a friend. He comes down to our level. He condescends to us. He comes as a man and as a weak man, coming needing to be fed and weary from a journey. He comes in that form to Abraham. Uh, this 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 tension, even in the Old Testament, even before Christ appears, we have this tension in God of the one who is so far above and the one who is so near to us mm. at the same time. And it's beautiful so that that Abraham can plead as to a friend and also have the confidence that the one he's pleading with has the power to do whatever he pleases, to to judge and to spare and to save. And that nothing is too difficult for the Lord. He is the friend. Also, one more thing about this that we don't want to overlook. What do you think the point is of, you hear him saying again and again, Abraham coming to him six times to him. What does that say about the Lord? Well, he, we, he's just because he's acting. So he's we know he's just, but he's also merciful. Yeah. Because he would have been totally just to smoke them all. Yeah. Right off the bat. Mm -hmm. The Lord is just and merciful. And I, I want to add a word to this and, and patient, mm -hmm. you know, look how patient and kind he is to hear his request. And now we know he destroys the city, but did he answer Abraham's request? Yes. Yes. He yes. didn't destroy the entire city. He let Lot and Lot's family go. Yeah. Could have included right. them in it. This is this is he knew what Abraham's request was about. This is about sparing Lot, his his son. And the Lord knows exactly what this is about and gives him exactly what he wants, which is son, his lot is spared and brought out, uh, along with those in his household who share in that faith, which are his daughters. They're a little bit messed up, as we'll find out later on. But that's why I like Lot's story is like, you can't find a more messed up individual. And yet he's still called righteous. Um, that gives us some oh, hope. There's hope for us. There is hope for us. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, we'll, we'll pick it up next time uh, with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in uh, a couple of weeks. So let me uh, close it out here.